interestingly enough, <laughs> one of my favorite topics to talk about, um, scientists discovered a new garbage patch floating in the Arctic. Yes, another one. A study by Science Advances shows between 5 and 13 million metric tons entered the ocean, and that was just in 2010. So to talk about all things plastics and things floating around in the water and much more, uh, I'd like to introduce John Burrard. He is with Rhode Island Clean Water Action. He's the state director. John! Hey, Molly. How are so you? So good to see you. So good to see you. Jonathan Burrard. And you brought us all kinds of goodies that aren't plastic disposable. That's right. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, come on in. Uh, you brought us some nice non-things that will be chucking and floating in the ocean. I like to call this the uh, the reduced starter kit, so we can talk a little bit about more what that entails later. Yeah, but, um, yeah we're going to get to this. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk to you. I sent you this email because I thought this was fascinating. Yeah, this is us holding up the things. Right. Um, I want to talk to you just a, a little bit about this garbage patch, uh, and then we'll get to clean water action. Um, a ton of stuff floating in the ocean. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on this. Oh, I think it's a terrible thing. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's a, uh, you know, we see these patches all over the world. You know, they're in the Pacific Ocean, they're in the Atlantic Ocean, and now we see they're in the Arctic now Ocean. Arctic. Like, who knew? Um, and so this is just a, you know, it's it's a symptom of, of the way that we um, choose to use things, use packaging, use products, and we throw them out. Um, we put them in landfills or not. Uh, they float in our waterways, um, and, and then they float out into the ocean and create these garbage patches. And, you know, for a lot of people, these are things that happen elsewhere, and they, you know, they're, they're they're uh, created by um, you know waste that other people put into the you know into uh, in the environment into the rivers and waters and all of that stuff. But the reality is that this stuff comes from our cities and towns. It comes from us. It comes from you know uh, people all over the world, really. But you know even if we think that we're disposing of things properly, once we put that item or that piece of trash or a piece of recyclable you know into the bin and it gets carted away, we have no idea what happens to it afterwards. Some of it can blow out of trucks and out of recycling bins and into our waterways and stormwater systems and things like that make their way down our rivers out into Narragansett Bay and then out into the ocean where they all converge in these gyres and create these huge garbage patches of plastic. So let's talk a little bit about that because <laughs> you just explained it perfectly. Yeah. It starts here, it goes, flies over, ends up in Narragansett Bay, and then it can fly out and end up in one of these huge garbage piles. I mean, <laughs> 8 million tons of plastic gets into the ocean. Scientists are estimating there may be as much as 100 and 10 million tons of plastic trash in the ocean. Uh, it makes my stomach turn yet again. Mm. Just thinking about that estimated number. Talk to me a little bit about clean water action, what you guys are doing right now, uh, some of your initiatives, uh, just to refresh people a little bit about what you're doing. Sure, so Clean Water Action is a membership-driven organization. We operate all across the country. We're active here in New England, in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Um, and we have 25,000 members here in Rhode Island, um, all across the state. That's every, a huge number. Yeah, That's and awesome. every, every, every city and town in the state boasts at least one Clean Water Action uh, member. We do a couple of different things. Um, we have a door-to-door -door canvas that goes out and educates the public and our membership on um, on some of the campaigns we're working on. Um, we, uh, we do some electoral work, helping to get environmental champions elected to local, state, and federal office. And the bulk of our work is really made up of um, these projects um, that we have that are grant funded through foundations and things. And one of the things that we, we do work on and that Clean Water Action has worked on for years in Rhode Island is waste management issues. And so, um, you know, we've, we've been around for decades working on things from stopping trash incineration um, to creating programs that um, require manufacturers to help manage waste at the end of their useful lives. So these are products that are harmful or difficult to dispose of. So, you know, we have e-waste legislation here. We uh, have mercury auto switch and thermostat legislation, um, mattresses, paint, um, things like that. Um, so Clean Order Action has really been at the at the forefront um, so of those waste reduction efforts. Yeah, so we work at the policy level yeah. um, and the community level. So we organize communities to kind of build support um, for these, you know, to push these um, policies at um, the state and local level. And so what we're working on right now um, is uh, what we're seeing across the state is a lot of um, source reduction strategies. And so you're, you know, you're talking about bag bans, bottle bills, foam bans, and things like that. 
These are getting really popular all across the country. So you're seeing these, um, you know, California's really led the way with these types of policies in place. They're working now. Uh, they have a statewide bag ban um, in place in California, which is huge. It's the eighth largest economy in yeah. the world, and okay. they've banned the distribution of plastic bags. And so they're working on uh, now getting um, the, the big thing in California is straw bans. And so we've seen uh, bag bans in place in Washington, D.C., and coming on up here, uh, we have them in place in Barrington, and then Newport just passed just a bag ban last month. Um, to ban the um, distribution of single-use plastic bags. And so we're helping to support local, um, you know, policymakers, um, it, you know, uh, get these, pol these source reduction policies into place. Um, and then we're also, like I said, working with the community to identify, you know, the types of things that they want to see in their community. So litter is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? It's, 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 it's outside of everyone's house. It's, it's in the streets. It's in our rivers and waterways. It's in Narragansett Bay. And nobody likes litter. But nobody really knows no, what to do yeah, with it. No one's um, really doing anything, you know. I, I was just at Narragansett Beach this past weekend, right. and it was beautiful. Walking down, and there's trash just washing up. So I start, you know, picking up things every now and then, and it's like, well, I'm walking. Do I really want to be carrying this stuff around? So you know, moving forward, what do we want to do about this? Let's. What do we want to do to take yeah. these next steps? These next pieces of action. So the next steps are to um, to really address the problem. And so the problem isn't litter. The problem isn't. Um, the stuff that we see in our streets and at Narragansett Beach and in our waterways and stuff. It's not, um, you know, the fact that our recycling rates are pretty low here in Rhode Island. Those aren't the problems. I mean, Those are the symptoms. <laughs> the problem, yeah, they're very low. Um, the, <laughs> the problem is that we put this stuff out into the waste stream and manufacturers put this stuff out into the waste stream without any regard for what happens to it after the point of sale or use. And so what we really need to do is we need to start focusing on the mantra we all know, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle. And we're all familiar with that phrase. We all get it, but are we all doing it? Right. And so people automatically go to the recycle part, right? Okay. So that's like that's like what everyone kind of focuses on. But the fact of the matter is that reduce, reuse, recycle is actually an order of operations. So when we were in grade, you know, grade school or high school, we learned in math class about the order of operations. Yeah. This is the same thing. We want to make sure that we are working as hard as we can to first reduce, reduce. the amount of waste that we create. Okay. And we can do that. We can do that on uh, a couple different levels. We can do it personally. We can walk the walk, right? And so we we saw my reduced starter kit earlier. Okay. Um, you know, it's 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 reusable coffee mugs, both hot and cold. It is um, a reusable water bottle, reusable bag. I don't have my reusable water bottle. Either. And reusable cutlery set. And even in my cutlery set. Oh yeah, I see the cutlery set. Yeah, I was so just talking to Glenn about these. Bamboo. I've got chopsticks, and I've got. A metal straw. Okay, so you've been trying to get me on these metal straws for a while. I was just thinking about this. Mm -hmm. I have reusable plastic straws, but you are all about the metal or aluminum straws, right? Well, I mean, it's either way. I mean, plastic. There, like plastic. It, Let's hold these up. Some sure. Time. I love this. Plastic. You, you just carry these with you. All I do the time, all right? the time, and people think I'm a weirdo when I whip them out. But you know what? I'm not using. I'm not using those plastic, you know, cutlery sets that have the little salt packets and come in a piece of cellophane that you also have to throw out that can run into the river and, you know, clog our bay and, you know, get into wildlife's uh, food, food, uh, the food chain and things like that. And so, so we can walk the walk. We can do. We can have individual actions. Um, but that's, you know, that's just the start. We also want to have broad-based source reduction strategies. I love that there are chopsticks in here, too, because how often are you literally, I, you're like, I don't want to use a fork for this, I want chopsticks. I use them they all the time. They have reusable chopsticks. I, I was shocked when I opened that up and saw them in there, and, and, pumped, and now I'm like, this is awesome, and I use them all the time. So. And you're so pumped that you have those. Yes. And so, um, uh, you know, so, so we, can do, we can do personal things. We can also stop using single-use stuff, and so, um, you know, that's, you know those, that's things like, you know, not using, you know, reducing the number of Ziploc bags you use, uh, reducing the number of, you know, if you use those little disposable floss things, don't use those. Um, you know, stop buying Mylar balloons for, you know, for your, they're fun and they're, they're awesome looking, but they're really harmful to, um, to wildlife and to the environment because they blow around easily and they get into the water. So just making conscious decisions about what we're using and, and, and how we're using it um, is the first step. And the second thing we really want to do to reduce the amount of waste we generate is we want to um, pass laws and policies that incentivize the reduction of single-use packaging and plastic items. And so that is where we see bag bans and phone bans and bottle bills and things like that. And those things have been, those types of policies have proven to be really effective where they're in place. For instance, in Maine, there's been a bottle bill in place since the late 70s, so over 40 years, longer than I've been alive. And 40 years? 40 years. Wow. And they have, they regularly see a 90% recovery rate in the amount of bottles and um, other beverage containers that they sell in their state. So only 10% of the bottles and beverage containers that are sold in Maine are unaccounted for. 
and that could be litter. It could be people just Good recycled job, them. Yeah, it could be like people just recycled them and didn't, um, you know, bring them to a redemption center. You know, so these things work. In D.C., um, they've had a bag fee in place. So it's five cents um, in order to use a plastic bag. It's supposed to make consumers think about, oh, I should have brought my bag and I wouldn't have to pay this fee. They see an 80 percent reduction rate in the amount of litter that they're finding in the rivers around Washington, D.C. And so five years in, this program has proven to be super successful and they have about an 80 percent compliance rate. So 20 percent of consumers are just saying, yeah, I'm going to pay the fee. But 80 percent of people are either you bringing reusable bags or using their backpack or purse or, or something like that. You know, we don't need to, you know, if we buy a single thing or two things at a store, we don't need a plastic bag to put them in. We can put them in our pocket. We can put them in our, you know, our, our bag or our purse or, or anything like that. Just think about, um, you know, where we can put stuff that isn't a plastic bag. I'm kind of, I, I had a question along those lines. Do you think when it comes to, we're sticking just with bags. Sure. Do you think that the negative is better than the positive? So for example, you said in DC implementing that five cent charge. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a, a negative reimbursement rather than, you know, companies like Starbucks or Whole Foods are saying, we'll give you a five cent reduction or a 10 cent reduction if you bring in your own. So encouraging people mm -hmm. to to bring in their reusable cup or their reusable. Do you think that it's, it's come down to like, hey, you bring in your own stuff or we're gonna charge you? Yeah. Do you think that the negative incentivizes people to bring in their own stuff more so than the discount? I think it's gonna be a combination of both. So okay. in DC, if you wanna go back to the DC example, um, yeah, there is a five cent fee on, on plastic bags, um, but there also is a five cent um, rebate to customers who bring their own bags in. And so it's not a- So it's both. It's, yeah, exactly. So it's a double, it's a double it's way both. to incentivize people. Um, you know, that doesn't exist cool. in all places. Um, and the other thing we gotta think about when we think about things like bag bills and bands is that there's a whole nother constituency in there and that's businesses. Okay. And so um, one of the things we, you know, we have to be mindful of when we talk about bag bands is that bags are wicked cheap. They're super cheap. They cost two to three cents per bag um, and they don't take up a lot of space on a shelf. So when you ban plastic bags, now you're incentivizing consumers to switch to paper. And now paper bags, yeah, they're compostable and they're recyclable. Yeah, what are we looking at with paper? They're also three times as expensive, and there's a huge carbon footprint to creating a paper bag. You can cut the tree down, mill the tree, ship the tree, get it to a mill, turn it into a paper bag, and it's heavier than plastic. Um, that also takes up three to four times as much space on a shopkeeper's um, store shelves. And so now, and we're also, and so we're incentivizing, so now businesses are paying more for this stuff that they give away to, con to customers for free. And we, what we really want to do um, is incentivize consumers to, instead of switching from plastic to paper, we really want to incentivize that switch from disposable to reusable. So we get okay. back to the, we get back to the, the reduction, the source reduction right there. And that's the behavior. Change. So the first, remember that first one was reduce. reduce. So, then reuse. Reuse. So you can reuse stuff. So even if you're going to buy a bottle of water, sometimes you're out there and you forget your you know, your your reusable water bottle and you got to go buy a bottled water. You're dying of thirst because it's 90 degrees in August. Exactly. Yeah. It's happened. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm admitting this freely on air. I have been known to be in that predicament. Sometimes you just it leave happens. your bottle around. You yeah. leave it on the bus and you need water. And so, but if you have that plastic bottle and you use it five times before you dispose of it responsibly, you recycle it. Now you've, you've reduced the amount of waste you generate by 80%. Like if you're a person who drinks three to four bottles of water a day, well, why don't you just drink the one bottle third part in the order of operations. And then you can get to that part. Yeah. Um, as we move forward, um, I, sorry, as we move forward, continuing kind of on that topic mm -hmm. of the reducing, reusing, Continuing on with water, um, let's let's talk about that business versus government incentive. Mm -hmm. Do you think that as we move forward here in Rhode Island, is it up to businesses to continue to push? If, whether we're looking at the government passing these laws, whether it's the bag bans or we'll get into kind of the straws and the bottles, is it up to businesses to encourage people to say, hey, we'll give you a discount if you bring in your own bag, or we'll give you a discount if you bring in your own coffee cup, or Hey, we're not going to give out bags anymore. We're going to charge you. Is it up to for local businesses to make the effort, and you know, then maybe the legislators will follow along? 
Um, in a way, I mean, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say it's up to businesses, but business is part of the solution. Like they are stakeholders in this process. They're the conduit for all of this stuff that we, that we use and then dispose of. And so they have a stake in it. And can so they be leaders? They can be leaders. And you've seen that some, um, you know, some chains have, you know, gone to these types of policies. So if I bring my, you know, I, I, there's a, there's a great little coffee shop right next door to my office. I get, I bring my reusable coffee cup in there and I get a large coffee for the price of a small coffee. And so awesome. every day I go in there, I pay two bucks for my coffee and, and you're that's like, it. Yes. You know, small that's coffee. it. Um, but you know, but you know, I'm just a, you know, I'm, I'm one person doing that and that's one shop doing that. And so that could potentially see the problem with doing things, um, you know, get into a little economics here is the problem that, uh, if you're doing things, uh, as a business, um, you're doing them, um, voluntarily, that's technically putting you at a competitive disadvantage. So other people can just not do that thing, um, and pay less money. So for instance, Whole Foods, um, you know, caters to a specific constituency, but they don't give away plastic bags. They give away paper bags, which are, like, as we've talked about, are more expensive and take up more room. But Whole Foods um, has a constitu constituency built in that demands that, and they have the money to do that. We talk about a small little, you know, pizza shop or, you know, a small little corner store or bodega. Um, they don't really have that wiggle room where yeah. if they're, you know, been, if they've been giving out plastic bags for years and years and now, you know, even if they wanted to do the right thing and give, you know, give paper bags or incentivize the use of um, reusable bags, now they're paying more. Um, they're increasing their costs, so they have to increase costs for their customers, and okay. so it's a competitive disadvantage. So the beauty of the legislative angle is that it creates a level playing field for everyone. Okay. So everyone's got to do it. No one's at a competitive disadvantage or advantage. So the corporations and businesses that can afford it do it. So Apple is a great example of uh, a company that's reduced their packaging. They have a great recycling program. So you can send your laptop back to them for free. They reuse the parts. They harvest all of them, you know, the metals and materials that they can. And so, you know, the, the you know, reduces their carbon footprint overall from start to shipping to store. Um, but they can afford to do that. Yeah, no a kidding. smaller company we're paying might not be able to. grand for our yeah, MacBook in the first place. Exactly. That's kind of why you pay a lot for an Apple. But um, that's part of the reason. And again, thing. Apple has a constituency that demands that type of um, corporate responsibility. Let's talk a little bit about, um, and we'll wrap things up here in a moment. Let's talk a little bit about uh, foam, because you've touched on it a couple times. <laughs> styrofoam. Um, I was surprised that there is still a lot of styrofoam. How much of it did you think is ending up in our waterways here? And is there any initiative? Is there any legislation? Uh, is there anything happening in Rhode Island, in New England, to ban that, to get rid of it, to reduce it? Right. What's going on? Because I see styrofoam everywhere. Foam is everywhere. And the problem with foam is that it breaks down so easily. It's, foam is cheap and it's light. Um, and that's why it, uh, we see it everywhere because it blows again out of trucks and recycling bins and things like that. It's everywhere. And foam is is one of the most popular items here in Rhode Island because we have uh, coffee chains that like to put iced coffee in a foam cup and, you know, their coffee and foam cup. Um, and this is not just one single chain. It's, it's several. You know, we use foam for hot beverages or to keep things cold. Um, we use them in clamshell takeaways. You know, so if you go to a restaurant and you can't eat your meal, they give you a foam clamshell again. Um, the, uh, one of the big problems with foam is that it is technically recyclable, but it cannot go in your curbside recycling. Um, so some people think it can, but it cannot. Okay. Um, so if you want to recycle foam here in Rhode Island, you need to actually physically drive to Johnston and See, I didn't even know that. Yeah, most people don't know that. <laughs> I didn't even know that. No, most people I feel don't. terrible. No, you shouldn't feel ter terrible. Well, I, I, don't, I usually don't use styrofoam, so maybe that's well, why. That, see, 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 you, you've, re you've uh, reduced before you even get to the, the recycled part. So I probably great. have had it at some point. Yeah. Um, not unintentionally. Uh, we're, okay. I, we're all guilty. Some, yeah. some of my favorite eateries are they have foam clamshells, but I make sure that I dispose of it responsibly, um, you know, until they switch to compostable or some other takeaway, um, you know, material, that's what we're stuck with. But um, there is uh, one bill in um, the General Assembly, so Senator Miller introduced a bill to, that would actually ban the distribution of plastic bags, foam takeout containers, and plastic water bottles. Um, it's kind of more of a conversation piece, you know, each of those 
each of those pieces of waste presents a different policy problem, and so they need to be handled a little bit differently. Um, but foam is a thing that could be banned um, easily. Um, I know some municipalities in Rhode Island are thinking about starting, starting to move in that direction. Again, uh, a leader in this has been the D.C. area. There's a foam ban in place currently in D.C., Montgomery County, and Prince George's County, so Metro D.C. Um, there's, a, again, a huge, um, uh, a huge buy-in from businesses. Um, once there's that level playing field, uh, now the uh, alternate products, so compostable clamshells and stuff like that, um, they actually um, cost about the same as foam did pre-ban. And in oh, California, they do? Yeah, they do, because there's no competitive disadvantage there. Foam is just cheap because it's cheaper. But when you're not giving away, when foam is not an option, it'll bring down the price of those alternative, um, you know, alternative packaging options. And so, do you think it's reasonable to see that being taken away just if someone takes the initiative? A, a big business maybe says we're making the switch. So it's interesting that you say that. So uh, uh, Target actually has just this week announced that they're going to dial back on the amount of. Um, foam packing they use in their products. And so if you go to Target and you buy one of those bookshelves you get to put together, you pull it apart and there's foam everywhere, yeah. right? It's all stacked with foam. Um, whereas if you buy something from Ikea, it's all cardboard or stuff that's recyclable. Yeah. And so Target is actually moving in that direction um, as well. But again, Target can afford to do that. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, you know, there, there are companies that are leading the way and there are localities and municipalities that and, and states including California that are kind of leading the way in in getting rid of foam and the thing the big thing with foam and, and plastic and all of these things that we're talking about is that that's what we've done for a long time that's just our mindset it's quick it's convenient it's cheap for businesses we don't think about you know well I do because it's my job but we don't often think about you know the the impact that we're making as a consumer we want our Starbucks we go get our Starbucks and we just we don't think about it you know sometimes we'll wash our cup up and make sure that we cycle the you know, the bottom of it um, if it's recyclable um, you know and that's about it that's about as far as it goes but we still continue to go to Starbucks and get our coffee in you know in reusable cups because it's convenient um, you know, it's a hassle. I'll admit it. I bring this stuff around with me. You're and carrying all this stuff. I, I'm like a pack rat. Like I have this huge bag and it's got like three drinking containers in it and my bag and my cutlery. But you know, that's the decision that I made because I, you know, I, I again, I'm, I, I have to walk the walk. If I'm going to talk about this stuff yeah. and I'm going to lead the way on, on these types of things and, and talk to my friends and family and kind of wag the finger at them when I see them using a foam cup. I gotta be able to, you know, show that I'm using my reusable cup. So I have my, <laughs> I have my fork in my computer bag over there. It's like my one, my yeah. one fork. So I need to get one of those sets. All right, they're cheap. I need to get one of those sets. All right, Jonathan Burrard from Clean Water Action. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks, can't Molly. wait to see. Uh, can't wait to have you back and talk about some other initiatives that you're working on within the state. So Happy to come back anytime. Appreciate it.